This is Duke University. If you could take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats. Good morning, Dick. Good morning, sir. Go ahead. Please. No, no, here. First, I, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Team Hayden again for last night. Those of you who are at the dinner, it was one of the most uh, spectacular uh, dinner speeches that I've, I've ever heard. And it was really just a, a fascinating insight. And uh, I really just want to thank uh, General Hayden and Janine for uh, gracing us with their presence last night and, and the candor and the remarks. It was one of the most memorable things that I've had in my in my legal career and obviously more, more than exceeded my my wildest dreams of what the uh, of what the dinner might be and I'd like to thank you again sir and and Janine I'd also like to apologize to my panel yesterday everybody got out 30 minutes early but not because I had some great plan it's because I was misreading my watch evidently and <laughs> and uh, the, the commander in chief, the commander in chief of the Dunlap household, advised me, in rather direct terms, that I denied our panel the applause that the uh, the folks did, and they really did a terrific job. So if we could give them a a, be a belated but never nevertheless very heartfelt uh, applause. Uh, one of our teammates, one of our attendees, uh, mentioned to me, well, you know, what, Charlie, what exactly is the after Afghanistan part of your conference? And I thought I'd spend a minute or two talking about that because my conception here is, is that we would take a look at, where, at what has gone on in the last 10 years, find out what lessons learned that we have, and then sort of set the agenda for the period after the, the battlefields are cooling. What, what, do, what is the work that we need to do for the future? In other words, it's kind of a setting an agenda idea. And I'm hoping that our next panel will take that kind of look, where we've been and what is coming up in the future, especially in the context of after the battlefields cool, but the threats still remain. And leading this panel this morning is a very old friend and mentor of mine, um, Professor Bill Banks from Syracuse University, where he is the director of the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism. I think I met Bill about 15 years ago when I went up to the Maxwell School for a program. Uh, Bill is one of the leading. I was 21 at the time you were 18. <laughs> yeah, I was 50. Uh, He's, he's truly one of the leading scholars in this area. In fact, we at Duke University, we use his, his book on national security law, his book and some other co-authors. Uh, Bill is a graduate of the University of Nebraska. He went to the University of Denver for law school, and he joined the faculty as a 14-year-old at Syracuse <laughs> University in 1978. That's and since right. 1998, uh, he has been, uh, I guess, a dual appointment uh, a professor of public administration at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, where we first ran into each other. Bill? Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. You're a good friend. Uh, 14 is just right in 1978. Uh, Cicero was credited with saying that in times of war, the laws are silent or they fall silent. Literally, Cicero was correct, but uh, even in biblical times when war was an everyday occurrence, informal guidelines limited armed conflict. And over time, throughout human history, of course, uh, we have found such guidelines to control uh, what goes on in times of war. Uh, but for the most part, law has been reactive. We play catch up. After the war, we do look at just the theme of this conference, what are the lessons learned, what comes next. But it's not always uh, adequate, I think, for us to be merely reactive, but we should, as, as lawyers and as uh, citizens, look to be normatively ahead of the next 
conflict. After all, the, the, the goal, of course, is to serve humanitarian aims of protecting civilians from the ravages of war, whatever form that war may take. There remain, remains, even in modern times, a great deal of skepticism that law matters in regulating warfare. Clausewitz uh, said in one of his most important works that the laws of war are, quote, almost imperceptible and hardly worth mentioning. <laughs> We're done. His, <laughs> his dismissive attitude, I'm afraid, continues to have considerable resonance with those who use force with impunity across the globe. States, of course, in, uh, led by the United States and our allies, many of whom were at the table yesterday afternoon, have led the way toward adopting codes that provide humane protection from warfare for civilians who are, are caught in its midst. Over the last century, of course, world wars and myriad military conflicts, both large and small, occurred throughout that century. And in keeping with the pattern, our legal regimes were for limiting the use of force on the battlefields, the famous Hague and Geneva Conventions and their protocols, some specific uh, multilateral treaties, emerging customary law, continued to lag behind changes in armed conflict. There were many advances in the laws of war, or what's come to be called International Humanitarian Law, IHL, based on the understanding that wars are fought largely by states against other states, or in a minority of circumstances by revolutionary or insurgent groups. By the turn of this century, however, some observers began to recognize, as did uh, British General Sir Rupert Smith, that instead of a linear process, now I'll quote General Smith, where peace is understood to be an absence of war, we are in a world of constant confrontation. In today's wars, Smith opined, civilians are, quote, part of the terrain of the battlefield, and war is directed against noncombatants. He was speaking in 2006, and of course then General Smith took note and presciently predicted, I think, the nature of future wars. The 9-11 attacks spurred the United States and its allies toward an extraordinary decade of military actions against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and then Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi regime. What the administration of George W. Bush called the global war on terror routed the Taliban in Afghanistan and then attacked Taliban and al-Qaeda terrorists in the Afghan-Pakistan border areas. Before long, however, what began as a counter-terrorist operation in Afghanistan and a conventional invasion in Iraq changed rather dramatically. Over those next few years, insurgencies flared in both regions in different ways and from uniquely local circumstances, but both enmeshed in urban areas and their local populations. Similarly, non-state terrorist groups were carrying out attacks in the Middle East. These conflicts brought renewed attention to what we now routinely refer to as asymmetric warfare, where conventionally weaker non-state enemies fight stronger foes in ways that neutralize the conventional strengths and exploit apparent weaknesses, such as the willingness to engage in unlawful attacks with prohibited means, knowing that the dominant state will abide by the laws of war and not reciprocate. Our uh, organizer and host today is uh, uh, perhaps uh, best known for his coining of the term lawfare many years ago. What year was that, Charlie? 2001. 2001, and now uh, lawfare. Use the term in a different Well, uh, some do, but uh, Charlie Dunlap was, has brought great uh, credit to uh, why we are here today by emphasizing one of the most uh, pernicious <clears throat> effects of asymmetric warfare. We have a fabulous uh, panel here this morning who will engage, I think, in uh, just what Charlie was looking for and what the conference is about. Where do we go from here? Uh, and the, the panelists have different uh, perspectives and will talk about different aspects of asymmetric war uh, going forward from, uh, from targeting to detention to, uh, uh, to cyber and beyond, and I'm going to move right to brief introductions of the panel uh, and stop talking. Each of them will speak for no more than 15 minutes, and we'll have some ample time uh, for conversation. 
among us and certainly uh, questions from you as we move forward. Uh, first here on my immediate left is uh, Lori Blank, who's the director of the Emory University uh, International Humanitarian Law Clinic and was one of the principal founders of that clinic in, in 2007. She supervises law students there and their work, assisting organizations, law firms, and tribunals in cases, projects, and issues related to IHL and human rights. Before coming to, to Emory, she was program officer in the rule of law program at the Institute of Peace in Washington, where she ran an experts working group on new actors in the implementation and enforcement of IHL. Um, Lori also worked as a litigation associate in the New York and Paris offices of Sherman and Sterling. In addition to a recent book, uh, uh, Now the Law of War Training, a resource for military and civilian leaders, she's published uh, numerous articles uh, on topics related to IHL and human rights. Uh, her work is fabulous and I, I read it uh, often and with great uh, benefit. Next, uh, in the in occupying the, uh, the center of our panel here, uh, Vice Admiral James Houck uh, the, the became the 44, 41st Judge Advocate General of the Navy in August of 2009. As the uh, Judge Advocate General, General Houck, or Admiral Houck, excuse me, is the Principal Military Legal Counsel to the Secretary of Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations, and he serves also as the Department of Defense Representative at the Ocean Policy uh, uh, for Ocean Policy Affairs. Uh, following graduation from the uh, Naval Academy, Admiral Howe qualified as a surface warfare officer aboard the destroyer USS Karen. He then entered the Navy's law education program, uh, graduated from the University of Michigan Law School, and later earned a Master of Laws from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, Admiral Howe's had numerous appointments. I'll, I, I won't detail them all. Uh, but I'll, I'll conclude by uh, mentioning that Admiral Houck's personal decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, the Defense Superior Service Medal, uh, five times Legion of Merit, uh, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, uh, three times the Meritorious Service Medal and the Navy Com Commendation Medal, uh, two times in the Navy uh, Achievement Medal. At the uh, far end of the table, is Richard Dick Jackson, who's Special Assistant to the United States Army, Judge Advocate General for Law of War, where he's served since 2005 when he retired from the Army as Colonel after 30 years in uniform. Dick has had extensive experience in the laws of war, in international and operational law. He served in infantry, in special forces, joint and coalition commands during his military career, <clears throat> spending most of the last 10 years as the principal legal advisor at the Army Division, Multinational Division North in Bosnia, uh, the Army Special Operations Command, U.S. Army Pacific, and Joint Forces Command, Naples Na NATO headquarters. He also served in operations in Panama, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Iraq. He was uh, chair of the International and Operational Law Department of the uh, JAG School in Charlottesville, and he's written extensively in professional publications and lectured around the world on law of war matters. He's also represented the U.S. government in several international conferences and negotiations regarding arms control, laws of war, and the protection of cultural property. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just first want to thank uh, uh, Charlie Dunlap and, and Professor Scott Solomon and, and all the organizers here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of making my husband jealous because he's a Duke undergrad and I got to come here and he's uh, not here. <laughs> so I've been telling him, oh, this is what I've been doing. Um, anyway, I'm really pleased to be here and um, to be on the panel with such um, distinguished um, other panelists. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is uh, some targeting issues and I I believe I will actually stick within the after Afghanistan theme here. The, the targeting issues I'm going to talk about are oftentimes specific to the use of um, drones, whether you call them drones, remotely piloted aircraft, UAVs, um, the things that are flying without pilots in them. I'm going to probably call them drones for ease of, of conversation, but I know there's lots of terms here. 
but there's obviously um, some of these issues relate to targeted strikes using other methods as well. So the first, uh, very quickly, what I'd like to do is go over some foundational issues with regard to law of war and targeted strikes and then dive into some of the interesting, challenging questions that are coming up now and will continue to come up going forward given the way we're using this tool. So the first analysis is, you know, is this lawful? How do we look at this under the law of war? Um, the first question, obviously, is going to be, are these weapons lawful? I, I think we can dispense with that fairly quickly here. The two questions are, are they indiscriminate or do they cause unnecessary suffering? With regard to drone strikes, they're using missiles fired from um, remotely piloted aircraft are the same types of missiles we're using oftentimes fired from piloted aircraft, and they certainly have incredible discriminating capabilities. Um, obviously, they could be used indiscriminately, but... Uh, as a matter of course, they're certainly not indiscriminate, and they have no particular characteristics that cause unnecessary suffering like poison gas, poison gas blinding laser weapons, or um, other types of weapons that are banned for that reason. So we can move from that on to how do we look at uh, targeting and whether this this approach is comporting with the law of war. And here we look at the three key principles of the law of targeting which are distinction, proportionality, and precautions. And this is really going to be sort of the foundational law of war analysis. But the question is, what is it about? Is there anything about the use of drones, the use of targeted strikes here that makes this interesting um, or poses some challenges? And I think there are some really interesting questions that come up here, not necessarily with the foundational analysis, as I said, but as we think about the consequences of this being a dominant methodology going forward. So with regard to the first one, distinction. The principle of distinction says that we need to distinguish between military objects and civilian objects at all time, between civilians and combatants, those who are fighting, those who are not fighting. This is sort of the fundamental premise of how we fight war within the rules. Uh, is we have to know who we're targeting. So. Um, what is it about the nature of the targeted strikes we're using now and the nature of the capabilities that how we think about this principle here? And we think about the nature of the combat that we're engaged in today and the nature of the conflict, whether it's Afghanistan or the tribal areas of Pakistan or its targeted strikes in other areas. In all of these cases, and I think this came up yesterday, the key question is always how do we identify who we are targeting? How do we figure out who they are, it's incredibly intelligence-driven. And it's also, um, it's intelligence-driven both in the figuring out who we want to go after and then figuring out if the person we see is actually the person we want to go after. So there's many layers here. The capability of um, the drones, UAVs, is such that we have these incredibly heightened surveillance capabilities. This pre, um, presents a heightened opportunity to comply with the principle of distinction. Does this mean it's always complied with? Not necessarily, because we have human operators operating these machines. They're not robots flying around in the sky. So anything, obviously, is dependent, again, on the human person who is uh, carrying out their obligations. But if we think about what, these, what drones do, they can circle over a target for hours, days, weeks, however long it takes and figure out exactly who the person is, if they're the person we're looking for, um, where they are at a given time. That offers, as I said, heightened opportunities to comply with distinction because you have the ability for very specific identification of the target. You can track them and ideally avoid mistakes. Again, not always, but in terms of what the capability offers. With regard to proportionality, the second component of targeting law, and I'm going to talk about a couple different types of proportionality as I go forward, but for now, let's stick to proportionality within the law of war, which says that um, you have to refrain from any attack in which the expected civilian casualties would be excessive in relation to the anticipated military advantage gained. So this is important to recognize that the law of war accepts that, that some civilians will die. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not a strict liability standard. Um, but the obligation is to refrain from any attacks that would be excessive. 
Again, this is entirely information-based in many ways, especially today. We all know, you read the papers, where is conflict taking place? It's not uh, all quiet on the Western Front, as I was discussing with somebody the other night with trench warfare and you know, fighting in the open fields. It's, it's taking place in urban settings, in and around civilian populations all the time. In order to figure out what are the consequences of a strike, we need information. The same type of surveillance information is very useful in terms of carrying out proportionality obligations. And here, um, it's important to talk about this, what's called the pattern of life analysis, which is what we engage in um, in Afghanistan and elsewhere before launching a strike. Uh, I think current regulations require 48-hour pattern of life analysis for any pre-planned targets. I don't know if that's still the existing standard, but um, that certainly has been. What does this do? Well, in terms of figuring out what the impact of a strike is on civilians, you need to know who the civilians are, where they are, what they do, what time they do these things. Is there a hospital nearby? Is there a nursery school by, nearby? What time do the kids go running through the street? Um, all different types of things. Is a building that looks like it's um, being used for military purposes actually being used as a civilian shelter um, in the evenings, or lots of different things. And being able to uh, surveil an area, surveil a target for many hours at a time, many days at a time, offers the capability to actually figure this out, as opposed to looking at it through a one-time lens, when you might not be able to see what else is happening. So again, the, the information gathering capabilities here, and the ability to strike at a wide variety of times, offer the ability to um, carry out this obligation well. Uh, again, we have seen many situations in which it's not necessarily carried out well. We see reports of strikes that have gone bad, um, and there are, again, there are people man, you know, making the decisions. Sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes people apply the law wrong. There can be lots of reasons, but in terms of what the capability offers. The final aspect of the law of targeting here in terms of a basic analysis is precautions. And here, the law mandates that anybody launching an attack take certain basic measures to protect civilians. Um, they have to ensure targets are military objectives. Choose a military objective that uh, projects the least harm to civilian objects. Choose the method of attack that's going to have the least likelihood of harm to civilian cash, of civilian harm, and give advance warning if feasible. Here, uh, the choice of weapon actually can does factor into the question of precautions because you have the obligation to choose a means or method of attack that offers the least likely harm to civilians. Uh, we could come up with hypotheticals in which you might say. Um, in fact, not a hypothetical. We have an example from last year with the raid um, and the um, killing of Osama bin Laden in which it was determined that because of the inability to gather sufficient information about what was going on in the compound, it was not the right choice to use a targeted strike from the air, but to go in with um, forces on the ground. And that's an example of how precautions can play out in practice because if you don't know who's there and you can't see what's going on, even given these heightened surveillance capabilities, then you don't necessarily have the ability to carry out your obligations using one particular type of, one particular type of weapon. So with that as background, um, I think what I'd like to do now is talk about what this methodology of targeting, what this use of targeted strikes as a major component of our um, of our tactics and our strategy, what does this mean in terms of the law? We see a lot in the news about what this means in terms of, um, you know, the uh, a policy and and diplomacy and and pushback from Pakistan or other countries and 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 what does this mean on the ground? How does it interact with coin strategy and so on? But I think there are some really interesting ramifications with regard to the law of war in particular. Um, that are important to point out, and a lot of times are getting lost in the shuffle here. One of them um, that has been talked about a bit is what does this mean for the status of the operators of the remotely piloted aircraft? Um, here, I think there are some interesting points to raise, but um, I'm going to go over this one very quickly. The real question has to do with who can launch attacks during, during conflict. And 
the law of war sets out, cla classifies people. That's one of sort of its key purposes. We have combatants, we have civilians. Uh, obviously, in the nature of the conflict we have now, um, it's, things get a little bit more murky in trying to understand. But in terms of, of who's launching these strikes under, with, from the U.S., um, if somebody in the military is launching uh, the strikes, they have combatant status as members of the regular armed forces. They are lawfully entitled to engage in hostilities, and they have combatant immunity to the extent that their actions comport with the law of war um, during the strikes. What about those who are not members of the regular armed forces, CIA, contractors, et cetera? We have hundreds of contractors, thousands of contractors who are engaged in things like launch and recovery with um, drone strikes. Here, they don't have combatant immunity. They don't have lawful combatant status. Is it a crime? This we see a lot in the news. Is it a crime that they are actually launching the attacks? Not under international law. Under domestic law, well, they might not want to get picked up in Pakistan or somewhere else because they're going to face domestic law. But it's not an international law crime. However, they're also not protected from attack anymore because they are directly participating in hostilities. So that has gotten... Uh, mushed up a bit um, in news coverage, but I think um, it's an interesting issue, but just one of those to uh, just to keep in mind, but doesn't necessarily raise uh, extremely dramatic legal issues. I think one that's very interesting is what is the impact of the, ca the extremely um, heightened information and intelligence gathering capability that we have on proportionality and precautions. So Proportionality, as I said, is designed to protect innocent civilians from the consequences of um, targets, uh, targeting and attacks. So the idea is that it looks at the standard based on a reasonable information, um, a, a reasonable judgment of a commander based on the reasonable information they have available or should have available. They can't ignore information that they could otherwise have. But again, it's not a perfect information standard. So what happens when we actually can almost have perfect information? We are approaching a place where we, uh, I, as we were talking about yesterday, the resolution on, on this capability is extraordinary. The change over the last 10 years is quite amazing. So what happens? Are we raising the bar for what is considered the reasonable information needed? Um, does it change the notion of what a reasonable commander should or could or needs to know before launching an attack? Um, is that good? Well, from the perspective of the humanitarian purposes of the law, it's absolutely good if information is better, if standards are higher, if we need to be more precise. There's no doubt. That's good. If you, if you kill less people who you're not trying to kill, then it's a better day. Um, but there's a flip side to that, um, which is if parties launching attacks uh, find that the standards become somewhat untenable, will they use less precise weapons? Will they follow the law less because it becomes a burden? This is one of those inherent balancing issues in the law of war all the time, balancing the humanitarian needs with the needs of mission accomplishment and the need, you know, to the ability to go after the enemy as much as possible. Um, another piece here is what about the sheer flood of information that's coming out? There have been stories in the New York Times about particular incidents, and they talk about the amount of information that's coming in, 40 or 50 screens up in the air with information coming all the time. And um, you know, those who are uh, the, the younger generation just coming out of school, they have the ability to multitask with 8,000 screens and devices and smartphones. But still, this may be more information than even they can handle. What does this mean? Does this, can this cause mistakes? Can this impact the ability to carry out a proportionality analysis? Um, one last thing, which I think we'll have time to get into in, in the question and answer period, sort of as a broader legal question here, is what about the, the overall paradigm that we're using for these strikes? Afghanistan is, a, is, a, is an armed conflict. There's no doubt about that. I think in Pakistan, certainly in the, in the border regions, the, we're engaged in an armed conflict. When we talk about the targeted strikes in Yemen and Somalia and potentially elsewhere, um, the discourse coming out of this administration, the previous administration, has been um, generally to blur the lines of what is the legal rationale. Why are we launching the strike against al or others? And we often hear, well, we've launched it 
because we're in an armed conflict and or in self-defense. Those are not the same thing, and they have different legal regimes that govern. Um, and I know I'm running out of time, but uh, if it comes up during the question and answer, I think there's a lot of interesting <laughs> questions there, uh, both with regard to how the law operates to effect its core purposes and, and how it can do that in the future that are, that are coming out of this blurring and conflation that, that we see in the discourse right now. Thank you, Laura. Dick, toward you. Thanks, Bill, and, and thanks, General Dunlap, for the invitation here. It's, uh, it's great to get down to Duke again and to this conference. I, I, when I was down the road in Fayetteville at uh, Army Special Operations Command, I'd come up here quite frequently, and this is, a, this is a, a, always a great conference. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to uh, speak to you today, too, about uh, the law of armed conflict and uh, maybe, maybe not uh, to predict the future, but at least to uh, examine the glide path of application of the law of armed conflict over the last 10 years and uh, hopefully extrapolate a little bit into how how it'll apply in the future. First, I want to react to um, something that uh, Lori said. Uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the standard uh, hasn't changed on, in targeting and that uh, proportionality and distinction are pretty clearly established concepts in, in law of armed conflict um, and that uh, the additional protocol one standards of targeting are based on the the reasonable commander applying the facts that are available at the appropriate time. Um, at the relevant time is the language used by most nations that, uh, that ratified AP1 and their understanding of these provisions. Uh, so uh, it's, it's almost dangerous for our military commanders to, uh, to apply, and I'm not suggesting Lori um, said this, but uh, to apply a standard of perfection um, to to the targeting decision, and and, and another illustration of this is uh, the NATO uh, report on on Libyan operations on their targeting in the in the Libyan operations to the ICC prosecutor. Uh, I commend that to you to to uh, see how far you can possibly go in terms of protecting civilians. In fact, NATO site in that uh, report said. Uh, if we if we anticipated a single civilian death from from an attack, we would abort the attack. That's not the standard. The standard is, as Lori Lori cited it, a, a balancing test of proportionality. Um, uh, and and the, these these trends of technology and uh, and and towards perfect knowledge are uh, developing a, a standard that's almost in, or are in developing a perception that there's a standard that, that's impossible for the commander on the ground to meet. Uh, I, I'd like to talk about another aspect of LOAC, and it's, uh, it's a hot topic these days in, in Washington and, and elsewhere, um, partially because of an observation yesterday from my colleague at the, at the um, JAG school, and that is the developments of the European Convention of Human Rights and European Court of Human Rights. And the, the, the one that, that uh, I'd like to talk about today is, uh, is Al Skaney. Al Skaney was, a, um, uh, was detained by the Brits for three years in Iraq, and the uh, European Court of Human Rights said that the uh, Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights would apply to that detention. Uh, that there was no exception built into Article 5, and the UK did not uh, take a derogation from that provision, so that all the due process provisions and, uh, and detention provisions for, uh, uh, for domestic law or, or human rights law would apply to Al Skaney. And he was awarded uh, um, a great deal of money for, uh, for this, uh, this um, detention in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the other, another um, current issue uh, it arises in the uh, uni un uh, universal periodic review that's required uh, by states to provide to the Human Rights Council. Um, the US noted in its recent submission of the UPR that it was reviewing the um, extraterritorial application of the uh, international Convention on, or uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. 
and, and my purpose is not to um, uh, talk prescriptively or, or even to uh, engage in uh, the debate that's uh, going on inside the interagency in Washington right now about the non-extraterritorial or the extraterritorial application of the ICCPR. Um, it's just to be descriptive and describe what, what I've observed as, as an increase of human rights law or domestic law application to in uh, armed conflict. And so I've seen over the last uh, seven years that I've been in this position and, and uh, worked on detainee policy uh, and on uh, detainee treatment, interrogation, uh, due process issues at the policy level a almost inexorable push of, of domestic law or human rights concerns into uh, the detention area, particularly because of the long-term detention problem. The law of armed conflict was created uh, to deal with armed conflict, and uh, the Geneva Conventions are very, uh, very much focused on the World War II model of a short-duration warfare between states. So when, when you have people that aren't wearing uniforms, that are a continuing threat to the nation and to, and to the armed forces uh, over a long period of time, who uh, the, the Obama administration, for, for example, reviewed the, those detained at Guantanamo and said that about 50 of them uh, can't be released and can't be tried. So of the 171 people that are at Guantanamo right now, we have a long-term detention issue or problem with respect to at least those, those 50 people. So um, that's been the real challenge that's driven changes in, uh, in the law applying to detention. I, and so I think uh, that detention is a good illustration of, of this issue. And so I'm going to uh, pick three different examples of uh, detention issues and uh, illustrate how over the last few years there's been a, a change in, uh, in, in practice that is based on the application of domestic law. First is interrogation standards. Uh, in February of 2002, President Bush uh, issued a memorandum that said we would uh, treat humanely, consistent with military necessity, those that were detained. That was a very low bar. And it, it included what uh, military folks call a Mack truck exception, uh, military necessity um, as, a, as, an, as a means of um, trumping uh, humane treatment in, in certain circumstances. Uh, and it, it almost got back to um, the, the approach that uh, the, the Germans applied in, in World War II of uh, of military necessity trumping any any uh, humanitarian concerns in the law application of the law, but uh, thankfully, in in a way, um, after Abu Ghraib, the um, we reexamined our our approach and adopted a, a very robust law of armed conflict standard in in the interrogation arena. Now that was partly driven by what was going on in Congress at the time in the discussion about the Detainee Treatment Act. But um, the, the famous field manual, uh, field manual 2-22.3, Human Intelligence Operations, uh, it was developed um, in parallel to the development of the Detainee Treatment Act. And it, it adopted a standard that is based on Geneva Convention 3, the POW Convention for interrogation which uh, adopts Article 17 of GC3 that says that no form of coercion may be used in interrogation. That's a, uh, that's a, a huge change from the uh, uh, enhanced interrogation techniques we, we heard about um, last night, and that was the military standard uh, beginning in 2005. Uh, military commissions practice also evolved um, in uh, re with regarding to coerced testimony and the admission of coerced testimony to a voluntariness test in the MCA in the Military Commissions Act of 2009 uh, with a limited quarrels-based uh, battlefield intelligence exception. So that has driven interrogations uh, away from battlefield interrogations for high-value high, high targets closer to um, a, a domestic uh, interrogation standard used by law enforcement, uh, Miranda rights. You've seen the, the argument in, uh, 
uh, for example, the case of uh, Warsami and, and others, uh, even domestic terrorists that are, or, or terrorists that are, uh, that are intercepted domestically, this argument about whether or not they should be given Miranda rights. Well, that really depends on what, what your end state is for those, for those guys. If you want to prosecute them, um, either under the military uh, commission's uh, uh, regime or under the Article Three courts, you have to have testimony uh, you have to have interrogations that are useful in court. So that really drives interrogations toward a, uh, a Miranda-like uh, standard. Detention standards. Initial detention standards, um, as I said, were based on humane treatment, whatever that means. Um, at, at, after Hamden in 2005, uh, humane treatment was fleshed out a little bit with Common Article 3. But what does Common Article 3 say? It says humane treatment and it gives a number of prescriptions. You can't torture them, you can't uh, um, assault them. There, there are various specific prescriptions, but there aren't, there aren't any standards to apply for humane treatment. So um, you, uh, detention standards have really evolved based on GC3 and GC4 standards, the standards for treatment of, of uh, prisoners of war and civilian internees on the battlefield, with the latter being the most significant in the treatment standards in, uh, on the battlefield. But even at, at Guantanamo, I, I've observed and, and uh, other outside observer, and outside observers have observed a trend away from Geneva Convention standards really towards a Bureau of Prison standards. Um, the the uh, current Camp 6 at Guantanamo is a, a, almost indistinguishable from a, a medium security prison in the United States. In fact, it was built on the model of a medium security prison in the United States. And Camp 4, the Stalag 13-like uh, um, camp, has been closed. So um, as we move towards long-term detention, the, the detention standards are moving away from a LOAC base to a domestic law-based uh, Bureau of Prisons uh, detention standard. And finally, due process. Due process, initial due processing standards in all theaters reflected rudimentary LOAC standards. Global screening criteria, magistrates reviews, Article 5 tribunals <coughs> were the standard early on. And domestic law, including Hamdi, um, cited favorably to that LOAC standard in, in, and, and compared it, in, in Justice O'Connor's opinion, essentially to administrative due process, notice and opportunity to respond at a very low level. Um, and cited favorably to uh, Army Regulation 190-8 that contained uh, Article 5 tribunal standards for the military. But um, and, and in addition, the end state, which in war is, the end state is peace. Um, so uh, the end state of having to turn over most of our detainees, you heard uh, yesterday about 20,000 at, at Camp Buka, those are all gone from Camp Buka. Um, <coughs> and most of them that are still being detained, and it's very few, are in the hands of the Iraqi authorities. So the end state is a, essentially a peaceful um, uh, rule of law based system. So the end state has also driven improvements in the process and incorporation of host nation personnel and standards. The examples there are uh, the, the MINFRICs in Iraq and the DRBs or detainee review boards in Afghanistan. Both of those were designed to move uh, detention to um, become an Iraqi-based uh, uh, problem or system. U.S. domestic law has also pushed the military toward more extensive due process. Boumediene established what I'd call a sliding scale for, uh, for due process. If Hamdi said the, the due process requirement is minimum administrative due process um, um, under the Fifth Amendment, uh, Boumediene described a, a requirement at the habeas-like higher end of the standard, including judicial review and uh, representation by counsel in order to, uh, to provide um, basic uh, due process rights at a later stage. Now, what the beauty of Boumediene, or, or some, some may say the pernicious nature of it, it is, to, uh, is to not define what the, what the goal is and to uh, allow a sliding scale over time. And if we don't get it right, 
then the judges will say, we guessed wrong and, and, uh, and end up providing habeas to individuals that are, in the, uh, that, that are uh, being detained. So in Michaela v. Gates, uh, Judge Bates said that, uh, that uh, detention at Bodrum, Bodrum didn't include um, uh, habeas. But at the same time, we developed uh, improvements to the DRB in, to fend off, in some, in some sense, um, habeas. And then the Law of War Detention Review um, executive order announced uh, last year for Gitmo detainees also incorporated <laughs> some uh, human rights-based standards. Finally, Section 1024 of the 2012 NDAA mandated that long-term detainees be provided military judges' uh, review of, of detention and uh, military defense counsel. So we've gotten very close to a habeas standard of, of review of long-term detention via the operation of domestic law, uh, not via the operation of law of armed conflict. Uh, in conclusion, human rights law has, a, has great overlap with LOAC. There's Article 75, Articles 4 through 6 of AP 1 and 2, respectively, contain provisions that are in the ICCPR. So there, there is a, a great deal of overlap just within the LOAC itself. But over time, particularly in non-international armed conflict, um, the end state is going to be the domestic law of the, of the state applying. So uh, military forces who intend on, on turning over those detainees to the host nation at a minimum have to ramp up their, their standards to get close to the domestic uh, law that will apply in the host nation. And on top of that, domestic law, uh, our domestic law has driven um, uh, detainee treatment standards and due process to, um, to apply human rights-based uh, standards over time. Um, why is this? Well, uh, law of armed conflict just doesn't get it, get it done in the long term. Law, detention um, in the long term uh, it, it requires more than, than the LOAC standards that have been uh, developed to deal with uh, armed cl conflict situations. Thank you, Dick. Sure. Admiral Howe. Good morning, and uh, thank you. Uh, special thanks to Duke and to, uh, especially to Professor Dunlap. Um, I, too, have a law of armed conflict topic to talk about, but I wanted to digress for just a minute. Um, to, uh, to say that I've really been thanking uh, Charlie Dunlap for years. Uh, almost 20 years ago, as a new judge advocate, uh, new to operational matters anyway, I was practicing in Bahrain with the U.S. Fifth Fleet, and I was probably over my head. I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, was advising the, the three-star fleet commander out there. It was after the first Gulf War and before the second Gulf War, and had been there probably about a week. And... Uh, after about a week, I, I found my boss had both of his teeth deeply into my leg and was gnawing on it because the Iranians were doing some things over there that he was unhappy about, and he wanted to do some things back. And uh, I, I was pretty sure I knew what the answer was, and I told him the answer, and he wasn't appreciative of the answer. And so I, I quickly found a moment to call back to the U.S. Central Command. And uh, the trouble was, with an eight-hour time difference, it was 3 in the morning in Tampa. And so I, I woke the Dunlaps up. And, uh, but Charlie is amazingly lucid at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and uh, he was able to affirm me and uh, give me courage to stick to my guns. And that happened on more than one occasion. Uh, also had the same sort of support from one of the participants here, a Homer Pointer, sitting in the back. And, I guess the moral of the story is that if you want somebody to come to your conference, then you need to be nice to them uh, <laughs> earlier on. And, uh, and it worked out. It, it worked out well for, for Charlie. Uh, right, right. Uh, I, I think it's a, a terrific event, and I really appreciated the chance to hear General Hayden last night. I've never met General Hayden before and he doesn't know me from Adam, but uh, one of the things we talk to our young judge advocates about, I talk to them about, and one of their core capabilities is courage and the, the willingness to put yourselves at risk for the greater good, and that's sort of inherent in military service. 
in terms of the willingness to lose your life, but it, it's, you know, there are thousands of ways to do that on a daily basis. And, and frankly, I thought General Hayden's comments last night were courageous. He could have come in here and given us a bunch of vanilla last night, and he didn't do that. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. The, uh, uh, finally, the, the chance to be on a panel with, with people like uh, Bill Banks and Lori Blank and, and Dick Jackson, and there's, there's so much law of armed conflict and national security expertise up at this table that you certainly don't need me to be here to add to it. But uh, I think, to paraphrase General Hayden last night, I, I feel like it is worthwhile for me to be here to uh, represent not the rough men, but the, to represent judge advocates. Uh, as the, probably the senior guy here, I think it's worth a comment about that because many of you are judge advocates or are familiar with them. But for those of you who aren't, uh, there are a number of great Americans, uh, young Americans, lawyers, who are putting themselves in, in harm's way every day and are advising commanders who are making the kind of decisions that General Hayden talked about last night. And I just think it's worth reflecting on that for a minute. Uh, they, uh, they go and do hard things, and uh, they, they put the law into action. Uh, they're also um, they're great lawyers, too. And I, I expect the other services experiences like mine, but you have about a 5 in 100 chance of getting into the Navy JAG Corps today if you apply to it. And uh, I, I expect it's that way in the other services. So uh, you know, a brief commercial in that regard. And that's what I love about this conference is that it gives the opportunity for somebody like Lori to sit next to uh, one of our young superstars, Commander Tom Leary, who's here somewhere, and for them to just get to know each other last night and talk and, and exchange ideas and, and uh, build that professional relationship. And I think it's fabulous. So thanks for and having so many JAGs here. Um, Afghanistan from uh, where to from here. Uh, for, from my standpoint for a few minutes, I, I would talk about uh, here, where to from here, here being Afghanistan, and a topic that you might not associate much with Afghanistan, which would be cyber, and what that means for us going forward. For me, the, the link between cyber and Afghanistan uh, it may not be immediately obvious, but when I think of Afghanistan and Iraq before that, I, I think the play word association, the thing that comes to my mind is IED and inter, uh, improvised explosive device and how for a while, uh, to be charitable, we, we weren't prepared for it and we weren't ready for it. And that had tragic consequences. Uh, and I, I think it's, I'll put this statement out there, anybody who wants to disagree with it can, but I, I think that as tragic as IEDs have been in the individual lives of service members, uh, as well as the strategic context of, of these two wars, uh, they may look like child's play in the context of cyber. And so I think what I'd really like to do just for a few minutes uh, is not hold myself out as an expert on cyber at all. There are those of you in the room who know, who know more about it than I do. Uh, but I, I guess from the, the bully pulpit of the position that I have right now is to just sort of issue a clarion call for lawyers to get with the program and to step up to the cyber legal challenge. Um, the, uh, I'm, I wonder if we are prepared as lawyers. There are certainly experts in it. I don't know how deep that expertise runs or how widespread it is in the uh, public sector legal community. Uh, I, I wonder if lawyers don't have a certain technological aversion that uh, scares people away from the topic. Uh, we lawyers tend not to be undergraduate physics and chemistry majors and such. Uh, they tend to be like me, uh, Asian studies majors. And I also know in our military, at least I can speak for my Navy JAG Corps, that um, I'm not sure we incentivize it enough. I think people want to go, they still want to go to the kinetic fight and they, they want to be wearing a BDUs and they want to be boots on the ground and they want the credit that our system gives them for that. And I don't know how sexy it is for people to sit in front of a computer screen or learn about the things that happen in computers. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, we, we've set up a, a cyber law division and some people said uh, when we did it that they're not going to have enough to do. And uh, I, I laughed at that and they've, they've had plenty to do. 
And it's small, and it, it uh, draws in the deep expertise that some of our reserve judge advocates have, many of who work at, uh, at OGA and other places. Uh, and we've worked with uh, George Washington University to try to get a, a, a focused cyber law course in the D.C. area that people can go to. But the, the real point here is, is I think we need to keep talking about it, and I think we need to try to understand it because, again, referring to General Hayden's metaphor last night that, you know, I'm glad that other people's wives, senior to me, criticize their images and their metaphors for things <laughs> because I know mine does. But I thought the, the hash marks thing was, was on, right on the mark. Uh, as lawyers, we've got to allow our clients to get to the sideline and get the chalk on their cleats because if we don't, we're going to lose. Um, so with that by way of uh, introduction, I wanted to just raise for consideration, uh, and I'll do it pretty quickly so we can get to the question and answer period, uh, a series of questions, um, and you can discuss them or think about them as you like. The first one would be, does the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, apply to cyber war? I think the answer is yes, but the devil is in the details, and, and how that question gets answered, it, it's important uh, not only for, for operational purpose and tactical purposes, but how we think about it is important for uh, how we designate lead agencies and, and where we send budget and who we look to in the first instance for expertise and where the talent migrates to in the first instance. And so uh, if, if we think about it in terms of uh, cyber as crime, we will gravitate toward a law enforcement paradigm. Uh, and the more we do that, the more we move away from an armed conflict paradigm. That may not be a bad thing, but I think we have to be really conscious of those choices in, in some of these uh, topics as we address them. Um, I think a second question that we need to think about is uh, if we decide that international humanitarian law applies, that the law of armed conflict applies, when have we been attacked? This is a fairly easy thing or a relatively easy thing to think about uh, in the context of kinetic warfare, but it is a more challenging thing to think about in the context of cyber. Uh, if, and this, I say this hypothetically, like who was it, Mark Twain, everything I need, everything I know I learned in the papers. Um, if, for example, a virus is introduced into somebody's nuclear production facilities and it destroys uh, a centrifuge uh, that allows the production of nuclear material, is that an attack? Probably so. It's destroyed something. If you introduce a worm or a virus that doesn't destroy anything, but it creates a violent consequence, so you cause the the, a classic example, you cause the uh, floodgates on a dam to open and water floods and kills people. Is that an attack? Probably. Uh, moving across the spectrum, if you uh, neutralize some national defense asset, you don't destroy it and, you don't, and it doesn't kill anybody, but you take it down for a while. Is, is that an attack? Moving farther on the spectrum, if you reach in and you destroy some data. Is that an attack? What if it's financial data? Is that an attack? Those kind of questions go on and, and of course, condition what our response to these types of situations might be. Uh, if we have an attack, who can we respond to and who can we attack? This raises some classic law of armed conflict questions such as uh, attacking civilians. And Lori got into it a little bit. Uh, can we attack an operator who sits there and is sending cyber attacks our way? Imagine a person sitting in a NASA type headquarters building and doing it all the time. All right, imagine a person who does it part time. Imagine a person who we're not even sure who they belong to or what cause they're working to. It might be a Sunni attacker in a Shiite regime and whether or not there is state responsibility for that. Uh, 
I'm looking at the clock, and I think there are a, a, more of these questions that can be asked, but I think what I would do is probably shut down at this point and allow the discussion to continue. That's great. Thanks. Let me ask a, a question or two to get the discussion going, and there'll be ample time, I think, for a good discussion here. One of the things that, that occurred to me uh, as you, the three of you spoke is uh, a common willingness among you to consider the possibility that LOAC or IHL uh, is an insufficient by itself to respond to the challenges going forward. There was discussion about human rights law. There was some talk about the law enforcement paradigm, criminal law, about domestic law, international criminal law. Uh, some worry about what we might think of as convergence among those paradigms, that the crunching together of the disparate uh, legal standards and approaches to problems of, of security and terrorism will weaken those regimes, either independently or together. What are your thoughts in the areas in which you discussed, cyber, detention, targeting, about the utility and limits of mixing the regimes for responding to these problems? Whoever would like to take it, I'd like to hear from each of you. I can start um, and and make the point that um, and the, and it's the lex specialis point that I didn't make in my in my opening remarks um, that we still have the we still have the lex specialis of the law of war. Uh, now, what what the ICJ court uh, a case on in nuclear weapons said about uh, the lex specialis of law of war is that. First, you apply the lex generalis, and they said that was human rights law um, with regards to the arbitrary deprivation of life. And then, then once you apply that lex generalis, you put on top of that the lex specialis of the law of war, which is what um, Laurie described as the targeting uh, mechanism, um, the, the targeting process. Uh, and, and, and essentially what... Uh, Attorney General Holder said in his speech about uh, targeting was that that's the process the U.S. government is going through in targeting. We are determining um, uh, arbitrary deprivation of life based on the, the uh, LOAC standard of what's arbitrary, not based on a um, domestic due process standard. That's, that's a more difficult um, uh, issue in the area I talked about, which is due process for detainees. Uh, I, I think uh, mixing the two, um, the two bodies of law is dangerous and, and uh, not dangerous in a national security sense, but, it, but it's, it's very burdensome on the uh, military uh, uh, infrastructure, requires a great deal of additional resources that um, we, sh we should not apply at that at early stages of a conflict. So um, I, I look at this, again, as a sliding, on a sliding scale like Boumediene. The lex specialis is much more important to apply in the, um, in the kinetic phase of the operations in international armed conflict, clearly, and then in non-international con armed conflict for initial detention. But over the long term, I think we'll be inexorably driven towards application of human rights standards to uh, do process uh, over the long term because the LOAC um, is designed for uh, a, a very um, short-term um, application. And you see that happening at Guantanamo? Yes, sir. Yeah. Admiral. Yeah, some, I guess some really brief thoughts on, on the issue of convergence. Um, I think this, the ends of the spectrum are, are pretty clear. I don't think anybody uh, disputes that there is some place in the cyber realm for the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law at one end of the spectrum. I don't think anybody disputes that there's a large uh, carve out and large relevance of criminal law uh, in the cyber domain. And there are many, many examples of that that could be cited. I think the interesting convergence problem is in the middle. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit of the discussion last night of, it's reminiscent of the Title 50, Title 10 discussion that began to take place last night. Um, if uh, Al-Qaeda has uh, networks that are beyond the immediate sphere of the conflict, for example, in Afghanistan, uh, are, is that a military 
question or is that a law enforcement question? I, I, I'm not prepared to talk about the answer, but I think that's the, I think that's the question. Uh, and a final comment to Dick's point about resources. It's, it is, I feel it very acutely that we have to understand the criminal side in the military and we have to understand the Title 50 side in the military uh, in, with far more depth and perception than we've ever had to before. And, and it does take more. Uh, and we have to devote more to do that because of the issue of convergence. That's great. Laura. Um, well, I think in, with respect to targeting, I think I would talk or I would uh, raise concerns more about conflation rather than convergence. I think the general point, is it a problem that there are all these bodies of law? No, it's, it's good. Um, I think those of us who are, most of us in this room are lawyers, we are, are because we find the law to be a useful tool. So it, it has its purposes. But I think the conflation problem, especially when we're talking about people dying, um, or about the need to protect our citizens from those who want to cause them to be dead, um, I think it's, it's, it's quite significant. Um, very quickly, I just want to raise, point out four areas in which, as I pointed out before, um, are the current discourse about targeted strikes is, is, is blurring whether we're doing it in self-defense or in armed conflict. If you're in an armed conflict, you can target as a first resort um, those who are legitimate targets combatants, civilians who are directly participating. If you're in self-defense and you're outside of an armed conflict, you're not targeting on a using lethal force as a first resort. You use the law of self-defense to get over the border into the place where you're going to attack this person, but you don't have the law of war because you're not in an armed conflict. You're now targeting based on what many would call a human rights or a law enforcement standard, which means that um, it's much more restrictive. Uh, it has to be an imminent threat. It has to be no alternatives, and that's a different standard than using lethal force in a first resort. Four areas in which this really raises serious issues. Um, is there an obligation to capture rather than kill? In the absence of an armed conflict, yes, there is. Um, what happens when you morph that into an armed conflict scenario? Or what happens when you morph the no obligation to capture rather than kill from an armed conflict into the non-armed conflict scenario. You can imagine it has consequences on both sides. What about the geographical area about where we're targeting? Does everywhere in the world become an armed conflict? I don't think it can. I think you have serious consequences about the lives of civilians on the ground if you make everywhere an armed conflict. We talked about proportionality before. Dick did, I did. Um, the law of war allows incidental civilian casualties. If you take that framework and you apply it someplace where there is no armed conflict going on, more people are at risk. Uh, outside of an armed conflict, we have the term proportionality in human rights law. It protects the object of violence, not the incidental casualties. Totally different scenario. We're talking again about, it's very stark. You know, are people living in a battlefield place or are they living in an area of peacetime? It changes literally sometimes whether they're going to live or die. Um, and um, another one that I would mention is how we identify targets. Are we looking at imminence? Are we looking at direct participation? Are we targeting based on status, based on conduct? All of these things get blurred um, when we don't specifically categorize what, why we're targeting in different places. Is flexibility good? Yes, of course, if you're a policymaker, you want all the flexibility you can have. But unfortunately, it has legal consequences on both sides, the protection of civilians and the, the ability to carry out the mission, the military purpose, the, the protective purpose of using our military power. Both of those can be limited, can be changed by conflating. So I think convergence, I don't have a problem with. Uh, I think you should use all the opportunities you have, but you have to be careful about how you do it uh, in order to make sure that the law stays relevant and, and has uh, its ability to carry out all its goals. Bill, can I uh, respond briefly to what, what Lori said? Um, she uh, uh, brought up the, the conflation problem, but she also, in her remarks, um, accentuated the conflation problem because um, self-defense in a, in a human rights uh, individual self-defense 
uh, mode is different than the use ad bellum national self-defense concept that's being applied with, with uh, drone strikes in uh, areas that are either ungovernable or where the state is unwilling or unable to, uh, to deal with the threat to the United States. So I, I would submit that the imminence of the threat in the Caroline standard use ad bellum um, application is different and should not be conflated with the individual self-defense um, uh, imminence problem um, that, uh, that Lori referred to. And, and so which would have applied in Yemen uh, on a strike against al Awaki? The use ad bellum. No, that's the one I was, re I wasn't referring to individual uh, self-defense. I was. We've had plenty of, uh, uh, of food for thought here and lots of basis for discussion, so can we open it up now? Uh, Scott, first question. I want to focus specifically on what you just discussed. Uh, Laura, you talked about conflation. In the Bren speech, in the Holder speech, we have the specific reference to inability to capture, which is clearly international human rights law and not classic law. Act. So my question is not that they're saying it, but what are we doing? Are we creating a hybrid paradigm that we seek to build as a part of customary international law. Uh, it clearly is not an inadvertent reference to that. But it's a, I, I think it's more than just uh, merging the two. I think there's an intent to build a legal paradigm that takes the benefits of both. Now, on the other hand, if, if the administration is saying that we're staying with a LOAC paradigm but building in as a policy filter, the inability to arrest first, perhaps even to gain more support in the international community, which is more of a human rights standard, then I can understand that. But I'm confused as far as how you, particularly Bill, and, and you're, this is your area, how are you reading what the administration actually intends to do with this either merger or conflation? Go ahead. Uh, I, th I think that's a, a very good question. I think there's a difference between looking at practice and looking at rhetoric. And what I'm talking about stems more from the rhetorical discussion than the practice. I think in practice we are seeing um, in Yemen, in Somalia, what I would consider to be a non, the outside of armed conflict targeting where we are looking at an obligation to capture rather than kill. Now usually you can't capture in those places. As Dick said, they're ungovernable, unwilling or unable to help us with it. Um, it's just a different, it's a different um, filter that you have to go through um, before launching a strike. So I think in practice, if you look at what we're doing, I think you can make a very good argument that we are not targeting on the basis of the law of war in Yemen, in Somalia, especially in Somalia. We tend to be um, following a more restrictive look at alternatives, can you capture rather than kill, targeting solely based on imminence and conduct rather than status. However, I think the, um, even though in those speeches it's been referenced, the, these obligations have been referenced, the paradigm that's been laid out at the beginning of the speech has been, we are in armed conflict or self-defense. Well, okay, which one? At what time? When? Because then you, you start to talk about things. If you all remember, there was a lot of debate after the Osama bin Laden raid. Did he try to surrender? Was he armed? Was he unarmed? These were not really important questions, but they became important questions because of the discourse. So all of a sudden now, the public discourse about targeting someone in the course of an armed conflict, because I think there was general agreement that that raid took place in the course of an armed conflict and he was a legitimate target, all of a sudden, there's discussion about whether there's an obligation to seek capture first. It's not a question that really should come up in that situation. Does it change? Let's say it does. Let's say now that enters the discourse, we're changing. Are we hybridizing? Um, I, I don't know if the US is seek. I think the US is seeking maximum flexibility. I don't think they're seeking to create a hybrid. Um, there are some out there, uh, Ken Anderson in particular talks about uh, naked self-defense or self-defense targeting. And, and we've talked about this, and he talks about an interim place between human rights law and law of war where we target essentially based on law of war principles. 
I find that problematic because as I was um, talking with him about it, I said, what do we do in, if you're applying law of war? When, when I tell my students, you have a hard question. You can't page through the Geneva Conventions and find the answer. Where do you go? You go back to your basic principles. What are the purposes of law of war? What are the basic principles? Distinction, proportionality, military necessity, humanity. If we have a hybrid, if we have an interim space, where do you go when you can't find a written answer? Um, and you don't know what are your core principles. What are your foundational reasons for making decisions in a hybrid? Where do you draw those from? So I find that to be problematic. I think it's better to be clear. You have all the tools you need with these various bodies of law. You have to figure out when and how to use them. But I think to mix, you, you take away that baseline ability to um, do your job. You know, the military actually has a, has a standard, and that standard is in the DOD Law of War program, and it says that um, in all military operations, no matter how characterized, we're applying the LOAC standard. So with regard to use and bellow, uh, the targeting principles that uh, Lori, <coughs> Lori described, if it's military conducting the operation, they're going to apply the use and bellow standard. So I, I don't think there's any... Uh, any problem there with the guy on the trigger knowing knowing what the standards are, um, but to, to get to your uh, question, Scott, I the um, th there's an argument that the necessity prong of the use ad bellum um, national self defense standard um, is uh, is applied in uh, considering alternatives. So, and I don't know uh, what the whether it's based on policy or based on on law. Um, in that phrase of, uh, of uh, A.G. Holzer's speech, but um, I, there's been some speculation that that's what that's going to is the necessity prong. Um, that was analyzed in the uh, Israeli targeted killings case as an alternative, but it was really based on a, a human rights standard in the, in the uh, Israeli case because of the ability to control uh, the territory in the West Bank, but not control the territory in, in Gaza. I'll just observe one further thing. Uh, Dick's comment reminded me in the, in the DOD Law of War manual, operational law has in many respects in this decade, would you three agree, taken us beyond the written law and beyond previous state practice. The operators are out of ahead of the planners. So op law may lead us here and the attorney general and the legal advisor may simply be recounting what the operatal, operational uh, people have developed on the ground or in the air. Let's, let's move on in the pink shirt. Yes. Yeah, my name is Richard Elman. Uh, what does the law say or in reality what do we do when the enemy continues to hide in schools, hospitals, and other public uh, non-combatant uh, locations? Yeah, good question. Dick, do you want to start? Uh, the, the, the law is, is, is exactly as Laurie described it with regard to distinction proportionality. But um, this, uh, these asymmetric tac uh, tactics make it much more difficult for the person on the ground uh, to, to uh, uh, deal with those, those issues. Uh, most of the time, um, generally, usually, uh, the soldier out out um, on a patrol is under a self-defense based ROE. So he responds to threats that he can identify and with a proportionate response that, that is designed to take out that threat to him and, and others, others around him. Uh, and, and the rules of engagement um, focus on self-defense but even provide uh, more, more um, restrictive in many ways uh, policy guidance because of the uh, current na the nature of the fight. Not only the asymmetric nature of the fight, but the, the fact that we're in a counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. So uh, for example, um, General McChrystal's tactical directive uh, that was later endorsed by General Petraeus and, and General Allen currently uh, focused on uh, looking at alternatives to neutralizing that threat so that you don't put those civilians at, at risk because that it's uh, a, a maxim on the battlefield that if you kill a bunch of civilians, you may be creating more terrorists and or 
um, uh, turning the local population against you in, in the future and uh, win an individual tactical battle but lose the, the larger war. Others wish to comment? Well, we often do less than we're legally entitled to do. I mean, for the very purpose that, that Dick talked about. Um, and there's, I, I think ultimately there's really little sanctuary for people in that to do it that way. We may give it to them out of our own discretion, but uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, they're not legally protected if they are otherwise lawful targets. Um, I would just uh, throw in another, another piece of the law. When, when I talked about precautions, um, one of the obligations obviously would be to figure out where there are civilians um, when you're trying to target something. Another piece of precautions goes from the other side, which is the defending party's obligation to take precautions. So the groups um, that uh, you're, there's lots of places where what you're talking about goes on, um, whether it's the Taliban or Hamas or Hezbollah, or other groups. In using civilians as a shield, in using protected objects like hospitals, mosques, churches, so on, as military facilities, they're violating the law. They have an obligation not to do that. They also have an obligation not to locate what are called military objectives in densely populated areas. So uh, they can't, you know, um, put their military barracks, if Hamas had such a thing, um, in the center of civilian area. In the case of, of those conflicts, the rocket launchers, those are military objectives. They launch them from a schoolyard. They're violating that obligation in Article 58 of Additional Protocol 2, which is customary international law. Does that mean that all bets are off on the attacking side? No. The obligation to protect civilians through precautions and proportionality and distinction remain equally strong, so it makes it hard. Um, it makes it complicated. And again, the rules of engagement or common sense or whatever reasons will often mean that attacking parties will not attack in those situations because they can't accomplish their goal without violating the law. So it makes it more complicated. But um, some would argue, oh, the law is not relevant. I would say the exact opposite. It shows exactly how relevant the law is, that those exact tactics. Another question? Yes, sir. Wait for a microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the use of non-lethal weapons such as emerging microwave and sound technologies. If those are ever acceptable, and does your answer change whether it's against opposing combat troops or against civilians for their own protection possibly, like riot control and so on? I did the legal review of the uh, active denial system, which is a high-powered microwave um, system that uh, that burn uh, that uh, uh, applies heat to the first one sixty-fourth of an inch of the the surface of the skin, uh, and it it's such a a, a searing uh, a heat that that people that are subjected to it have to get out of it. You know, it's an involuntary response to get out of it. But if it's used properly, it's, it, it doesn't result in any um, uh, permanent injury, no, no burning or uh, second or third degree burns kind of, kind of thing. Um, and, and that's been fielded and, uh, and uh, sent to theater but not, not used yet. Uh, and it, its intent is to be used uh, around uh, forward operating bases to um, or to, to fend off uh, groups of civilians that riot and uh, maybe because a Koran has been burnt or something uh, and uh, and attack a, a forward operating base, but to not to injure them in the in the response. So it could be used against uh, against both combatants and uh, and civilians who are a, a lesser threat. Good. I think we have time for one more question. Homer. I'm Homer Pointer, retired Navy and currently FBI. I have a question mostly for P P Professor uh, Blank. In the context of the bombing of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998, the bombing of the coal in 1999 in Yemen, 9-11 uh, in which my friend John O'Neill was killed at the World Trade Center, Bali, Spain, England, 
How do you define or at least describe the battlefield? How much time do you have? <laughs> About four minutes. <laughs> answer as long as it takes. <laughs> well, I think um, obviously it's not an easy question. Um, there are uh, those. There are some in the international law uh, academic community who. Uh, place very um, strict parameters. You know, Afghanistan is the battlefield, and there, then nowhere else is the battlefield. I, I don't think that's a rational application of the law or sort of common sense. Um, on the other hand, as I said, I think saying there's a global battlefield is problematic. I think with respect to the events you mentioned, there's a temporal aspect to this as well, because um, you can't just necessarily reach as far back in time as you want. Um, the, the way the law of armed conflict applies is there's an objective determination of the facts on the ground to, to determine whether or not there's an armed conflict. If you have two states fighting each other, armed conflict, international armed conflict, you don't need to go any further than that. In, outside of that, when we talk about non-international armed conflict, in general, we look at a range of factors, the two that the uh, the ICTY and other courts are really focused on our intensity and organization of the groups, but I think it's also important to look at other factors like how the government is responding. Government response is very telling in terms of whether or not it's armed conflict. In general, before 9-11, except our use of um, cruise missiles in the aftermath of the embassy bombings, we responded with law enforcement to the USS Cole and to all these other attacks. We did not talk about an armed conflict. We did not act as if we were in an armed conflict. Things changed after 9-11. I think that's very telling. If we look, so in terms of the temporal aspect, you, you want to look at lots of different things. But in terms of how we define where the battlefield is, I don't know that I have an answer where I can draw lines for you. But I think that I would point out one interesting um, piece of information that I think helps uh, show that this is not clear cut, which is that um, traditionally, in an armed conflict, the territory of the belligerent parties is part of the battle space. World War II, World War I, you know, we fought wherever the different belligerent states were fighting. Neutral nations were not part of the battle space. So if you look, but that doesn't seem to hold true today. If you look specifically at how U.S. courts have talked about where the battlefield is, and it's not like they've had a specific court case on this. These are throwaway comments. During World War I and World War II, the U.S. courts were very specific in how they referred to U.S. territory. The Port of New York was part of the zone of active military operations. They talked about, in other cases, U.S. territory is clearly belligerent territory, part of the battlefield, battle space, zone of combat, whatever you want to call it. In all the cases to do with detainees at Guantanamo and Bagram and elsewhere, the U.S. courts have used exactly the opposite language about U.S. territory. It's not within the zone of active hostilities, not within the theater of combat. They, they use different words. To me, that's very telling. U.S. territory is not part of the battle space. Does that mean everywhere else? It, it can't possibly be that everywhere in the world but the U.S. is when we're the main state party fighting. It, it, just practically, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, we're not launching strikes in Oslo. We're not launching them in Vancouver or Paris. Is that because, you know, obviously the unwilling or unable test isn't relevant there? But there's lots of pieces of how we would think about this. But I, I just point out what U.S. courts have said because I think that's, I found that to be very interesting that obviously uh, we're not looking at this the way we have looked at it in the past. And I think it's important to look at almost each place as we go and, and think about it rather than trying to just draw the biggest lines or the smallest lines that we can. Yeah, it's important to, to look at, at two, two different triggers, though. The, the armed conflict trigger that Lori just cited, but also the use of force justification. And that's what I was talking about, was the, the use of force justification um, in, a, in a sovereign state, which is applying the UN charter uh, approach to uh, the use of force. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what a fantastic panel. I think we could have gone on, we could go on the whole rest of the conference to these issues. <clears throat> but I can't let my good friend Jim Houck get away without saying something about him as well. Uh, 
Hey, Mr. Gunn, Rob Preston, uh, numbers were in the Pentagon during a, a very difficult period. And the importance of the moral courage that this gentleman demonstrated, I can't go into all the permutations of what was going on in that time, but it, it really is a model. And this is why he's a three-star admiral. This is why he's the Judge Advocate General of the Navy, because he has that kind of leadership and that moral courage in times of great stress. And that's one of the things I want us all to think about as we look forward, preparing ourselves for that moment when we're under great stress and the legal profession really has to stand up and put itself, put in your individual careers at risk to make sure that the right things are done. Let's talk about it a little bit more during the break. Uh, we'll come back uh, around 10, 15 or so, and really exciting panel. The next one is, is fantastic. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.